Okay, so here we are. All right, so Lauren, thank you so much for joining me all the way from Sydney. I love, love, love this global community of ours and how crazy it is that we have so many shared experiences and yet also yeah. so many different experiences, right? That all are kind of rolled into this. So uh, let's um, get started. And, and why don't you tell me kind of when you were diagnosed, how old were you and what was going on in your life that really led to the diagnosis? Of course. So I have actually only recently been diagnosed. I was diagnosed May this year. And I, I feel like my diagnosis story is like one of those movies that starts like at the end and then it's like a giant flashback. Because, oh my God, yeah. Because for me, kind of the actual diagnosis stuff happened very quickly, but it was kind of like it was all building and I had no idea it was. So what happened? Um, it kind of happened because, so I was working, I'm a speech pathologist and I was working in a private practice at the time. And my boss, who I got along really well with, had just finished her master's in clinical psychology. And little did I know, she had just been diagnosed about five months earlier. But I was saying, because at the time I was kind of um, struggling and now I realize it was ADHD burnout. But I was also really concerned with my driving and because my partner was really concerned as well because most of the time I would be absolutely fine and safe and wonderful, but I was just having these lapses in attention where I'd just miss something and we were both really worried about it and a few other things going on. I was just talking to my, just chatting to my boss and mentioning this and she just looks at me and goes, maybe you have ADHD. I'm like, what? She's like, you sound like me. And because she'd been my supervisor for three years, she was like, actually, this would explain a lot. Because <laughs> she was like, you really struggle getting paperwork done on time. You get distracted quite easily. Like she had to move me into one of the back offices because when I was near reception, whenever someone would come out, I would like go and have a chat or I'd, I'd always be listening. Um, and for me, I think, cause I didn't realize at the time, but I didn't fully understand ADHD. I thought it was that hyperactive boy running around the room. And cause of course, like, and that's a lot of what I'd seen as um, working with a lot of kids who have ADHD diagnoses and when I then looked it up and found out about, you know, more inattentiveness, but even that, just how it presents in women and hyperfocus, because the big thing was always, it can't be ADHD, you're really good at school. Because that was never an issue for me. But all the ADHD stuff for me was at home. Um, but yeah, so she made that comment, and if it was anyone else, I probably would have, get, would have gone, like, you know, gone, like, okay, but, you know, like, not totally e egotistical, but also be going, but I'm not like the kids that I work with or things like that, but because it was my boss, I was like, if she's saying this, I definitely have to listen. And then I did the hyper-focus deep dive and was going, oh my God, this is me. And then within like two, and it also explained, like I said, that flashback, it kind of explained everything that I'd kind of struggled with. I didn't realize it was a struggle. I thought it was normal. I just felt different my whole life. And um, yeah, then I booked the appointment um, two days later. And a few days, for a few months later, I had the appointment with the psychologist and got the diagnosis. And yeah, that's kind so, of my, um, how it happened. So um, the it doesn't sound like there was much of a waiting period. It, it I feel was, like that's something we hear so much, especially in countries that have decent health care. Yeah. <laughs> socialized health care that it's like, oh, and then, you know, the wait, it was two years or whatever. 
I'm really, really lucky. The wait was only two months. I was also slightly relentless. I called and called and called and called places. So a lot of places that had um, closed their books, weren't taking on people for ADHD assessments. They take people on for other types of assessments, but not ADHD. Um, A few had a six month or an eight month wait. And I think I was just really lucky that um, the psychologist psychiatrist I got in with he I have a feeling he might have been actually quite new to the practice and building up a caseload I'm not sure but that's what I suspect and he was also telehealth only which might have made you know other people go elsewhere but for me I was like great I'm very busy I'm going all over the place that means wherever I am I can stop and have my appointment (laughs) Um, so no, I think I'm incredibly lucky. Like my brother who, um, he's in the process of getting a diagnosis at the moment. Um, he had about a six month wait. So it's usually, luckily I haven't heard anyone for two years, but I've heard a lot of people struggle to find someone and the six to eight month wait seems to be very common, unfortunately. Yeah, I know, right? Um, and it's it's interesting that they'll see they'll see you for other diagnoses, but not ADHD, right? Which is clearly indicates that like it's that it's not a it's not a dearth of staffing. It's or time. It's mostly what is it the testing you think, mm-hmm. or like what's is it the different who's available for the diagnostics, or what do you think is going on there? I'm honestly not sure. Um, it might also be, and this is. Please know there's no data. This is just my thoughts. Um, I do wonder if it's also like clinical interest mm-hmm. of the um, practitioners as well, because I mean, and I I know this that from my work that there's certain areas that you might want to focus more on, or maybe there's just too many people and it, everything is getting overloaded. I honestly am not sure. Because, I mean, for me, I was, like, it was an hour conversation. Um, So I didn't do any assessments. It was just a conversation with the psychiatrist. And then I had the um, diagnosis at the end of it. Yeah. So That was my experience, too. It was, you know, a half-hour conversation with my um, general practitioner, my uh, my doctor. And it's so amazing how different, you know, how many of us come to our diagnosis from diff- different ways in terms of like, sometimes it's a three hour full psych assessment and, um, you know, and, and, and other times, you know, it's like you, I always joke that like, I walked in the door with all of my paperwork fumbling and was like, eh, and my doctor was like, yeah, you had me at hello. <laughs> right. And I, <laughs> and so, oh. right. It's so interesting too. Like, I think, um, this idea that what we're ha- what is happening right now in this like boon of diagnoses right so many women especially adult women are coming to um they realize that this is ADHD and that there's this real like this is like you said I love that uh, the metaphor of the movie starting at the end because it really is this profound experience of looking over the whole course of your life this is not women who are just seeing one meme about losing keys and deciding they have ADHD and I think that for the most part this like that there are a lot of mental health professionals especially who are kind of rolling their eyes and saying like ADHD ADHD is so trendy right now. I don't think it's this. And my, you know, I always want to throw it back there and be like, this is, this is, um, you know, yes, a lot of people are experiencing this right now and are coming to this realization right now, but it, you know, if it's not ADHD, what is it? And at the same time, like, it's entirely possible that it was ADHD all along. This is exactly what is happening. Um, in, in so many areas, and I, I'm going off on a little tangent here, so stay with me, but like recently John Oliver was talking about, um, he was talking about gender. I don't know if you saw his episode on gender, but he was talking about how like everybody rolls their eyes. He was talking about this in reference to sort of the non-binary, right? And and that so many people, and trans and non-binary, and he was talking about like people roll their eyes, everybody's non-binary nowadays, and oh, it's such a fad, and they're not going to want to stay this way. And he was using the example of left-handedness, and he was like, when in the 19 1970s or 80s, 
when teachers stopped forcing children to become right-handed, the number of left-handed people skyrocketed because people were free to use whatever hand they wanted. <laughs> and so you could look at those statistics and say, oh, everybody's left-handed nowadays. Oh my God, it's such a trend. But the reality is the, when the information is there, when you're seeing yourself through this new light and you're able to kind of understand that this was ADHD all along, of course the number of people with ADHD is going to skyrocket. Like it makes perfect sense. And so I'm, I'm so, every time somebody rolls their eyes when you start talking about ADHD, I'm like, nope. Like <laughs> I'm just so frustrated because I was there too in the, you know, I, I feel mm -hmm. like I was also there for a long time being like, what is happening? Is this ADHD? Why are so many of us suddenly realizing it? And I feel like he just used this perfect he, he just had this perfect way of, of, of yeah. demonstrating and explaining, like, of course, when you are able to live in, in the, your truth, right. Um, then, and, and you're starting to connect these dots, like, yes, absolutely. More of us are going to start realizing that it was this all along. Entirely. And that was definitely my experience. And I'm sure it's the experience of most people who listen to this podcast. I remember, so my partner works from home. And I, um, my appointment was at the beginning of the day. And so I just started work a bit late. I remember afterwards I walked in and, and I said, I have ADHD. And he was like, why are you smiling? This isn't something you should be happy about. And I was like, no, but it's, I said, I feel like there's a weight on my chest and that I had no idea was there is gone. And it's amazing just that one thing, even before, like, you know, starting any treatments, um, a friend of mine had a really good analogy because, you know, I, as I'm sure a lot of women that you talk to also have anxiety and was seeing psychologists and doing a lot of work around all of that. But I think without realizing it, it was like this piece is missing because I just thought this was anxiety and it just felt like this huge weight. And I was like, I'm doing all this stuff. How can I still feel like this? And it's because anxiety was a very small part. The rest is ADHD. But my friend had this really good analogy. She was like, it's like all this time you've been trying to put a puzzle together without the lid of the box. And someone has given you the lid of the box. And because that diagnosis alone completely, I think it gave myself permission to not judge myself and shame myself. And I was so much more proactive and to have words for things that I never had before because I didn't know it was a thing like task initiation. Um, and like, you know, the internal, cause I'm, I get the internalized hyperactivity cause I'm, I'm the combined subtype and just all this language that I could use to actually say, this is what I need. This is what's happening. That alone, like everyone around me was like, you are like in a, so much, sorry, in a much better place. And this, yeah, without anything else, just that diagnosis alone. And like also my relationship, because my partner is very neat and orderly and everything has its place. And so it would drive him insane that he was like, how could you not put it away? And I, or how could you not clean that? And I'd be like, I don't know. It's like, I can't see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is what I was being trying to, but now he was like, I know, I really get now you're not doing it on purpose you're actually trying as much as you can and you can't do this oh and, my god yeah and you've got me yeah. so i'm so emotional and, you you were giving me goosebumps before uh when talking about it because it's so true right it's like and and may you know this idea that like you see you know one thing occurs to you or when people talk about adhd like losing keys or uh you know oh a squirrel that's going to make you not think you have it, right? I'm not going to relate to any of that. I'm not going to re relate to that rhetoric. Um, and so it's when you start doing that deep dive and your whole life flashes before your eyes that you start to really see like, oh, okay, this is 
all of those misconceptions that we have. You're definitely, I mean, it's funny too, because I feel like I've interviewed so many professionals who worked with ADHD children for a long time and still had those preconceived notions um, uh, in terms of what it looks like. And I, you know, I, I have a son and a daughter and I actually kind of had, I did very poorly in school. And so I had that stereotype too, right? Of like, oh, eight kids with ADHD do poorly in school. And I did poorly in school. And it wasn't until I started interviewing women for the podcast and like one after the other, I was interviewing women who did very well in school. And then in adulthood, they were just a ball of depression and anxiety <laughs> and seeing like, oh, okay, I see how those connect and the perfectionism and then the sort of need to, to the masking and all of that and the, and the white knuckling and all of that anxiety. And then I looked at my daughter, my teenage daughter, and was like, oh, okay, I see that because she's an honor roll student. She does really well. And and so when I, I got her diagnosed and I recently was asking for a 504 because I'm like, that's what you do as a parent, right? You get a 504 for your child. And we were sitting, I was sitting in this room with a bunch of these school administrators and it was like we were speaking a different language. They were like, why are we here? She's an honor roll student who gets 90s. Why are you asking for accommodations? And I was like, I don't. I don't know. Why am I asking for accommodation? Like I had this total moment of like, should I not be here? Should I not be asking for accommodations if she's already quote unquote doing well? And they, and I just saw that, that it was just this like visceral moment of realizing like how misunderstood kids are by their teachers and their administrators who are like, I don't know what you're talking about. They're doing fine. And me being like, they're not fine. They're clearly not fine, but not really not understanding what to do in that situation. Yeah. Was, I'm still processing I, all of that, but <laughs> that's really, that's fair. And it reminds me because of course I'm, you know, still rel relatively early in this journey and reminds me of two things. First one, even like before I had the diagnosis when people would go, Oh, you're so organized. Cause they'd have systems and schedules and things. And I'd go, no, no, no. I'm actually very unorganized. And if I don't have anything, nothing will get done. And, or I'd talk about things at home and everyone would be like, no, I think even my partner was like similar. And then he started to live with me and he was kind of like, like, Oh my God, like you're a wreck. Not in those words, but I think he was like, wow. Um, and then, so I think you put a lot of effort in that people don't notice until you're somewhere where it falls apart. But the amount of effort I was putting in really, um, really realized it because again, pure ADHD moment. Um, um, trying, yeah, had my medication, was still working out the right medication for me. And I was taking it and I wasn't, you know, felt it might have been making a bit of a difference, but wasn't sure. And totally forgot to, I was like, at the end of the bottle, I need to book a new appointment. <laughs> Six week wait for the appointment. <laughs> um, and love that to access treatment for executive functioning requires extra executive functioning. I know. And so I had this period where I didn't have my meds and I was coming home just feeling tired, but awful. Like just, I'd spent so much and I realized I was putting so much extra energy trying to keep everything in my head and all the balls up in the air, um, that I didn't know that that's what I was doing. And I was kind of part of it. I was like, oh, this is masking. Or like, this is what it is. Because I would have been very similar to your daughter. I was very, like, very good academically. Went to university, graduated with honors. But I was having to put so much more effort in. And I guess the other thing is with the accommodations is that is looking at it, is that going to take the effort, the, that masking and extra effort she's putting in off, off her. So actually, yeah, the output they're seeing would be the same, but 
will she actually be feeling a lot better and more herself not having to do that? Right. Yeah, that's the big question, because I think they were kind of looking at it, especially the teacher who was in the room was sort of like, you know, how much do you, she has a 95? What you just you don't you, you need accommodation so she can get what, 100? And I was like, no, that's not the point. The point is that right, that that we're trying to alleviate some of the anxiety and the pressure. I'm seeing a very different child than you are. And I see a child who if she gets a 75, she has a panic attack and you know and so it was one of those situations where i'm like i want to do whatever i can to make her feel like we're doing something (laughs) to help with the anxiety and they were basically like get a therapist i was like we already have a therapist (laughs) you know but they were basically like these are problems that are not school related so school accommodations aren't going to help you need home accommodations and you need outside accommodations and i was like but all of the anxiety is school related. And and that was, I think was the other disconnect too, communication wise, where I was like, we just, you know, like I said, feeling like we were speaking different languages. I think it's the idea that ADHD is all about academic achievement, but it's about also about the effort and everything you have to do to get there. Right. Yeah, exactly. I know. Right. It's the same reason why, like when when my doctor told me I was how hard I was working when I was explaining to her my elaborate system on how I don't lose keys. (laughs) And she was like, wow, you work really, really hard. And then I like burst into tears because I was like, nobody's ever said that. Right. And, And that's like you said, it was that twofold realization that a you mean everybody isn't like this, but then at the same time, also then realizing like, oh, right. Yeah. I am really working really, really hard to just stay afloat. And, and that is, oh God, it's such, there's so much grief there when you have that realization, right? Where you stop and you're like, oh, I am working so much harder. Um, so are there, are there things in your past where you're like, oh, the signs were clearly there all along? Does I'm assuming my whole life doesn't count as an answer. <laughs> um, like a, a friend of mine who's known me for a while, who's studying psychology and she has a brother who's um, has ASD and likely ADHD. She sums this up and she turns to me and goes, how did we not realize that you had ADHD? <laughs> Cause I feel like, yeah, for me, always losing things, the, I get really into like my school because I hyper focus. I'm re- on study is what I I've always done it because I'm very curious and it's motivating for me. And that I'd always be so into it, I would then forget something, or you'd then look at my desk and everything is everywhere. I'd con like interrupting people, having you know, five unfinished craft projects in my closet at any given time. Like there's just all these little things that it's kind of like, yep, no, that's ADHD. (laughs) That's just, yeah. but it was always, and I think the reason why I just had all these little examples is because it's all this stuff that was always, oh, that's just Lauren. And now it's, oh, actually, no, that's Lauren's ADHD. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And and I guess going back to that, why it's so frustrating when people minimize this experience and say like, oh, you saw one TikTok video and now you've decided you have ADHD. And you're like, no, I saw one TikTok video and then I saw another and then I saw another. And then I went into, you know, hyper focus and I did all this research and my entire life flashed before my eyes. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's um, also... Go ahead. So I was going to say it's interesting because for me... It was because we've now realized that I think I mentioned, yeah, my brother's in the middle of getting a diagnosis. My mum is um, going to get assessed next year because, like, you know, she, like, wants to have that concrete thing, but we're pretty much, like, you have ADHD. And my mum's 59, and there's so much struggle she has had that she was just like, had no idea. And now she's like, this makes so much sense. And all this, and all this like stuff in different places she's worked of people basically saying like, you know, you're not trying hard enough or often the paperwork and things like that, that it just, 
it's so freeing. And the fact that that alone has also changed my parents' relationship, even though they've, you know, been together for like 35 years. My dad, it's just been that final thing where my dad kind of gets it now. And mm -hmm. also when they, they had COVID earlier in the year and dad was brain foggy, like, and my mum said, this is what it's like for me all the time. And he was like, how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> that's why like, I married what? you, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh, I know. It is. Oh, that's so sweet. Oh, my God. You're giving me all the feels today, Lauren. Um, it's so sweet, right? Because it is like, just think about how much your life changes and, and how much is in front of you in terms of this changed outlook on who you are and how you operate in the world. It's just... Uh, it's so wonderful. And, and yeah, it's completely changed my relation, my marriage. It's changed how I am as a parent too. I mean, it's really, yeah, just realizing and, and why I, so often is I've, you know, it, I love when, uh, I love thinking about how it's been called piece of shit syndrome <laughs> because I think that, you know, explains so much, right. About how we view ourselves until we have this diagnosis and it's like learning to walk all over again. Yeah. You know? Definitely. And I think for me, the biggest thing is kind of working out, you know, how to manage the anxiety and all of that, because I kind of, I would be given strategies and then I'd find it really difficult to use those strategies. Like when I did use them, sometimes they'd work, but then I have guilt of then, you know, it's my, my fault. I'm not sleeping like X, Y, Z because I'm not using the strategies and that's built up my whole life. It's now taking a lot of effort to kind of go, well, actually, what if it's more all these strategies were made for someone who was neurotypical mm -hmm. and that's not my brain. So of course it's not going to work for me. I need to find different strategies. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And maybe those strategies will work this week, but they might not work next week and that you have to prepare for that as well and have a sense of humor about that as well. I think also, right. Which is like, um, you get really, really excited about, you know, this idea about consistency and I'm like, whoa, 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 hold up. <laughs> that's, that's not going to work forever. Um, and you know, you need something new and that's kind of part of that's part and parcel, right? It's like you have, you take the good and the bad together. Um, so, okay. So I want to talk about your speech pathologist, and I'm sure it's also been mind blowing for you to think about the ADHD brain and just some of that overlap. Right. Um, and okay. So, you, so where do I want to start here? You worked with a lot of kids with ADHD. Let's talk about, um, developmental language disorder and what exactly mm -hmm. is it? And you know, why, why is there so much overlap? Why is it so com? Why is it such a common comorbidity with ADHD? Okay, so I'll answer as much of this as I can, because I think okay. there's also part of this that we have theories. Yeah. We don't have, you there's know. There's a lot of correlative sure. talk, not a lot of causal talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, but there's a few factors in that that I'll get into later. But first, so I think it's important. So the term developmental language disorder is actually quite new. It was um, 2016. 2017 they had um can't remember the name of the study but i'm happy to give it to you to put it in the um notes that basically they realized that everyone was describing the same thing but calling it something different auditory processing specific language impairment expressive receptive language disorder but we were all kind of describing the same thing so Lots of like therapists and different professionals kind of got together and, did, um, and decided on the term developmental language disorder. And basically what that means is, yeah, language difficulties with no known cause. Because there's certain developmental disorders that have affect the language, well, can, as part of the disorder, has can have an associated language disorder, like for example, autism is sometimes it's kind of part of the diagnosis, in which case we would call it language develop, sorry, language disorder associated with autism spectrum disorder. 
but when we don't actually know, like when there's, you know, we can't look at the brain and say, oh, yeah, there's nothing else that could be causing a language disorder. It's developmental language disorder. However, because this is relatively new, you're going to come across a lot of people that don't call it that. They'll still use specific language impairment or different things. So that's kind of the consensus was like in the prof profession internationally, developmental language disorder, but it's as always trickling down, you're probably going to hear lots of different terms that really describe the same thing. Like ADD um, and ADHD. <laughs> exactly. And so in terms of, I guess, what it is, what, it, yeah, what do I mean by language difficulty? Um, there's different ways of breaking it down. A lot of people break it down into receptive language, which is understanding language. Um, so that would include understanding an instruction, what words mean, what, um, understanding inferences, like understanding jokes, sarcasm, um, and multi-part yeah, multi instructions and multi-part stories. How do you follow a story? How do you understand an argument? Anything to do with understanding or like, you know, understanding a conversation. Um, and then the using language or expressive language is how do I put my ideas into words? knowing what words you can use, what words to use when, how to structure your ideas, how to tell a story, how to give a persuasive argument, how to um, tell jokes, how to um, yeah, have that conversation. But it's, and as I'm sure your brain's already ticking away, there's a lot that I've probably said that it's like, but ADHD can also cause that difficulty um and so it's basically about and this is one of the tricky things is that someone with a language disorder when you're looking at their behaviors they can actually look similar this is a language disorder with nothing else to someone with adhd but for the person with ADHD, they're not following the instruction because they've been distracted by everything else or their brain's going like, you know, thousand miles an hour. So they're not attending to the instruction. But someone with a language disorder is not understanding the instruction. What do you mean by do, we'll do this, like do this after you do this? their language centers just aren't able to break that down if that makes sense yeah no but, absolutely but i'm like how do you know in the moment diagnostically which it is especially when you're dealing with young yeah. children yeah um, and also one of the big red flags is how we know this might be a language disorder is because often kids with language disorders are the class clown or the child with all the behavioral difficulties which again, sounds very similar to the red flags to ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, one of the upsides is um, it seems that a lot of our language measures um, in the tests that we do to diagnose can actually be quite, of, and yeah, I was reading a study last week that can actually be quite effective in telling the difference. Because if you also think of it at the, in a language, when you're doing a language assessment, it's usually a clinical room. It's a small room. There's very minimal distractions. It's one-on-one. -on -one. And um, I know the policy at the private practice I worked was we were very child-centered. So if that child, as soon as we noticed their attention going, we would stop the assessment and book another session. So there are some children that I did the assessment in like 20 minute chunks because that's how long I could, like we, I'd still do like the sensory breaks and the physical breaks, but that's just how long I could get them. And, and I think, um, and the, um, uh, measures that we're doing 
it's what they we're breaking down what they do say when they are we're looking at what they understand when their attention is there so and look by looking at a lot of the vocab measures and like i said a lot of the actual te type of tests in language assessments research has shown that they're actually quite good at that differential diagnosis of adhd and language um but it's it's still tricky because sometimes you also get someone that will walk into our clinic and i might assess their language and on that standardized measure they're fine but then if i look at how they're using language day to day they're really struggling mm. so even though they might like and of course there's a lot more into it sometimes there's still like a language disorder going on but sometimes it's kind of like that's just might not have enough to diagnose but let's just do some work to show you how to communicate and i find if that's all the child needs that once you kind of show give them those pieces they sort of take off but um if yeah sometimes that diagnosis can also be an ongoing process mm, that's so fascinating um, yeah, I, I feel like that's sort of similar with handwriting too, with dysgraphia, right? Which is, um, that idea of like, if my thoughts are, if I'm having a difficulty sort of getting my thoughts to, into my fingers to write and they're going too quickly and then my handwriting, you know, and then I'm missing word. And so it's like, there's so much overlap there in terms of what is actually ends up, what you're actually and, seeing. And what can also happen is sometimes I'll like, a child will come and they'll be like, oh, we're thinking dysgraphia because they're having trouble with their writing. But their handwriting is fine. It's, you can read it really well, but it's actually the breakdown is the language. Mm. They don't know how to structure a paragraph. They don't know how to structure a story. They've got these ideas, but they don't know how to communicate that in their language. And so actually it's when, yeah, then, when you see a speech pathologist and cause we also can do work on writing and reading and all of that as well. We then realize, no, there's actually, and often, you know, there can be dysgraphia and other things as well. And part of this can definitely be part, part of dysgraphia, but sometimes it's actually, no, this is, this is a language disorder, mm -hmm. but it might be in the way that, like some kids, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff, they're pretty good, but it's, I guess, what we call the higher level language skills, which is the harder language skills, like metaphor, structuring, and argument. And that is when the wheels fall off. Oh my goodness. Oh. Yeah. This is so fascinating. God, you make me want to like go into deep dive about this. Cause I, I'm very curious. My head, I had a, a daughter and a son and my daughter was like hyper verbal from a very early age. And she was basically like reciting poetry by the time she was two. And my son was nonverbal, nothing until after the age of two, he just screamed. <laughs> and so we, we, he had a speech therapist. He, we had tested always for his hearing and, um, um, and uh, he had a speech therapist for, for years and years and years. And so it's been interesting sort of thinking now having them both diagnosed and sort of all of this knowledge around neurodivergence and, and kind of what is happening and what is firing in the brain. It's so interesting to think back because he was, he was also tested for autism because he was very like, um, solo, you know, he played alone and, and a lot of that stuff. So he was tested at the time. And so now I'm kind of like, what, what were they not seeing? What were they seeing? Like, it's so interesting to think about, oh my God, just the brain. It's, it's so confounding and amazing. weird. <laughs> and also forgot to mention, there was a, um, pretty sure the systematic review that said that the crossover of developmental language disorder co-occurring with ADHD was between 20 to 90 percent. Yeah, I believe it. I think part of that discrepancy is also when you look at a lot of the behavior measures for ADHD, they're language based. For example, how like um, I think some of even like the parent parental checklists 
how are they with following instructions? Yeah. And things like that. That requires a language skill. So are they not doing it because of the ADHD or language? And another thing is that sometimes I'm not as familiar with the assessments for, because um, I think a lot of the assessments of ADHD, at least in pediatrics, is more um, teacher and parent report. But I also know that when you look at the, um, I, yeah, so the WISC, I'm assuming it's the same um, in the US, which is one of the um, really popular IQ assessments. Mm -hmm. Some of those items are language based. And this is one of the things that I learned from my boss who, um, or my old boss, who then great mentor to me, the boss that's part of the reason why I got diagnosed. Because she's a speech pathologist and a psychologist, she can do a lot of these assessments now. But with that dual qualification, she was looking at the scores and sometimes it would come, de- come out as like a low IQ or low area. But it's because when you look at the subtests, the one, one, it's, you know, everything would be pretty equal in where they were scoring. But then there'd be two, if you look at the chart, there'd be two um, scores that have scored really, really low. And then, but when you look at those tests, they're the two subtests with no visual supports. It's all language. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that's what happened with my kids when they both did their psych assessment. My daughter was like oh, yeah. scored like, you know, they were it was all percentile, so it was all like you know ninety percentile and all of these different things, and then auditory processing. She was like point zero fifth five percentile or something hilarious. Uh, yeah, we're like, okay, you're you're a, a visual processor. Got it. But also uh, sometimes what my um, and of course, I have no idea the case um, with your children because I'm not a therapist. But I know some kids that would come through our clinic. We would then look at it, and then you look at the language schools, and you're like, actually, this is because I have an underlying language disorder. It has nothing to do with their IQ. It's language centers. Yeah. Because that test was relying on their language skills. And if you have a language disorder, that's going to affect how they. Oh, uh, I know. I'm, you're breaking my brain right now. I'm just like, <laughs> there's just so much to think about. Ah. But I think the the main, I think my main, cons- my main recommendation would be if you ever have any of these concerns, always try to book, like, even if it's, you know, a, the six, unfortunately, the six, 12 months wait for a speech pathologist. If you've got access, trying to get that assessment, and then you can cross it off. Like whenever I've had a parent that says, oh, I don't know if you should come in for an assessment, I always go, look, if you're not sure, sometimes it's better to come in. And if there's nothing, then at least you know. But if there is a language disorder or something going on, then you've got the information that we can do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I find those like Venn diagrams are really helpful too, uh, with a lot of these co-occurring disorders or even just like with ADHD and like, I I always try to like Google the Venn diagrams for like PTSD and ADHD and OCD and ADHD. I always find them fascinating too. I don't know. There's something about the visual of the Venn diagram. Yeah. I never thought of that. And after this interview, I'm probably going to go Google Venn diagrams, but yeah, Um, but the, the tricky thing is, is it's hard to know exactly what, um, like we think there's definitely something genetically linked with all of it. Um, but in terms of, it can also be difficult knowing what the exact, I guess, correlation between, and this would be the same for like dyslexia and dysgraphia, but like, for example, DLD or developmental language disorder and ADHD, because it often falls through the cracks. And for example, like we, and I think you and I both know, we were talking about earlier how ADHD often falls through the cracks. 
developmental language disorder is even more so. So I think this is the way in Australia, and I think it's consistent in the US, the estimate is that one in 14 children have developmental language disorder. So if you're talking about a classroom of 30, that's two children in every classroom. Mm-hmm. And, well, but no one knows about it. Or, or I talk think... about it and they're not diagnosed. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. I feel like that's I feel like ADHD is sort of one of those things, sort of like the iceberg, where there's all of these various um, presentations and you'll get diagnosed with something and be like, that's the answer. This is what it is. It was dyslexia all along. Right. Or, oh, it's this. It was, you know, it was anxiety all along. And you kind of hold on to these identities around these diagnoses and not realizing that the iceberg was ADHD um, and that, you know, (laughs) it was all of these things. Surprise. (laughs) But I think, you know, it's when you're in that state of sort of confusion, like many of us are like, what is this? What's wrong with me and then you can kind of glom onto an answer really quickly we have a tendency to do that and especially when when we're talking about parents and kids right which is like oh this is it and and then you realize that like oh no surprise there's a whole lot more under here also say like i can't i don't think you can i'll ever fully get what that position is like until i am a parent of it's one thing going through it for yourself, but trying to go through it with your child or for your child, I just, that would just be a whole different experience. That's just extra, I imagine extra overwhelming and extra anxious. And like I said, I, I say, I imagine, I don't think I will ever fully get it unless I'm in that position. Well, and I think it's so, you know, it's so entertaining to me that so many women come to their ADHD diagnoses through their kids, right? Because they desperately want to help their children. And so they go into hyper-focus mode and then they start researching, like, what is, how can I help them? How can I do absolutely, you know, 150% and they just go into hyperdrive. And then that's when they're like, oh, right. This explains my life a lot. I I see a lot of myself in this and realizing, you know, and then they start connecting the dots it's so much easier to do when you're helping your child instead of helping ourselves which i think says a lot i think that you know says a lot about just the state of overwhelm a lot of the time when it comes to our mental health and everything else (sighs) um so now how so how would a parent how would a parent know what's developmentally appropriate and what might be a sign like what 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 might be like a telltale milestone where you could say this is definitely outside of the Venn diagram. So it, that question can be tricky to answer because it's different for all ages. Yeah. Um, okay. But if you look at a lot of the associate, um, I'll talk broadly because I know that you've got an international audience, for example, in Australia. Um, but uh, most countries have their, um, have a speech and or hearing association. So in the US you have ASHA, um, which is amazing. And I also use their resources, even though I'm down here. And a a lot of, and in Australia, we have Speech Pathology Australia. A lot of those websites break it down for all the different ages, how many words they should have, how they're following instructions. Um, And um, that can be a really good tool to use because the other thing is I feel, I also feel like there is more resources of people usually more aware of a smaller chart. So like, for example, by around 18 months, you'd be hoping somewhat like a child is saying between 20 to 60 words and by two, they're definitely starting to combine words and put them into sentences. Um, and I do whilst that can still be overwhelming. I feel like people have a better idea with that than when they're older. And I think the big thing is if they're taking, if it's effortful for for a school age child, you can definitely talk about milestones. Um, But I feel like the big things is if they're getting really frustrated and it's really effortful and hard, like, you know, 
and they're having to put extra effort into understanding what the teacher's saying or the page is blank because they haven't written anything or when they're starting to avoid work tasks it's kind of like okay is something else going on here mm -hmm. um, yeah because i feel like often it kind of there's can be so many answers to that question because you know it can just everything we're saying before it can be adhd it can be anxiety it can just be like you know not being bored but i find i think and again this is i'm talking purely from experience i find actually if a child's really starting to get really frustrated and really avoid it's usually because it's just really, really hard for them. Mm -hmm. And it's worth seeing if there's a reason. Right. And then, yeah. Or if they're like my son, where they were just screaming all the time out of frustration, <laughs> which was a and really difficult time. Uh, I can imagine. I really can imagine. And that's because um, now, my so everything I'm talking about, my current job, is actually at a school for children with um, disabilities. And a lot of the children we have are nonverbal. Mm -hmm. And they're just so frustrated, but giving them a way to communicate because like, it's, it's just life changing. Like if you think of not being able to, like we communicate in everything we do, it has a shoot and also how we assess how we access therapy is usually based on verbal skills how we access education is based on verbal skills and reading and writing it's all through language and communication skills how we connect with other people conversations friendships all of that a lot of it all starts with communication so that's why we often get this flow effect when a child is having a communication difficulties it affects just about all aspects of their life and there's also a lot of study studies and i think this is international that a lot of people in jails and juvenile um, detention centers have undiagnosed language disorders god it's so amazing that you have this dual perspective too. Cause I think about like working with children with, with, um, other disabilities, um, who might be nonverbal, like to real, it's, it's all coming down to this same logic, right? Which is this same idea of like, this method isn't working. So we let's figure out what is working. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. And, you know, and I think some of that, especially, you know, um, um, I imagine having somebody who would be nonverbal well into, are you thinking about some of the, like, the 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 there was a viral clip about a nonverbal valedictorian at a university recently where they were giving the valedictory speech through like an AI and it was that same idea right of like how people just sort of assume that there's something wrong with you or that you're not smart if you're not verbal and kind of realizing that it always really comes down to like we need to figure out what is the method of communication that's going to work for you and I feel like there's a lot of parallel there with any kind of uh issue about neurodivergence right and and this Definitely. idea of like stop trying to force something that's not going to work for you so it's so wonderful that you've got this multifaceted perspective yeah and in especially special education we often talk about the idea of assumed assumed competence right or the least dangerous assumption assume that someone can do it or like yet yeah, which one is least dangerous assuming they can do the thing or that they can't do the thing and like for example um i had a really exciting really exciting moment a few moments actually at work this last week where there was this um eight nine year old non-verbal on the teacher and i uh, sitting going i actually think he's really switched on but the most verbal he could be was he'd grunt, but like he could get his point across. Like we knew he understood and he'd, and I had an AAC device and I put it in front of him and usually I have to teach them how, so, sorry, AAC is a way to communicate that's not based on verbal speech. 
So like if you think Steve, like that valedictorian speech is a really good example. It's a way to communicate, usually involving technology, but not always, that isn't talk, like speaking verbally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and there's so many different devices out there that you kind of, it's always finding the best fit. Anyway, um, we try this and I put it in front of this child and usually I have to teach them how to use it, but he was automatically pushing my hand away and exploring it himself. And cause, um, in the U S do you guys have morning circles sometimes at the beginning of the day? Yeah. So yeah, like that routine. And that's mm -hmm. when we do it because the teacher was like, he's bored in morning circle. And I think it's because, you know, he can't engage. It would be great if that's when we try using this. And so I'm sitting next to him. The only word I had shown him where it was on the device was morning circle. Within 20 minutes of him just exploring, he pipes out, no one likes morning circle, bye. <laughs> and we were just going, oh my God, like, because if we didn't think he could do that and just put that in front of him, he never would have been like, you would have assumed because often people probably would assume, oh yeah, like, you know, whatever. Cause he just, you know, walks around points and grunts, but he's actually very cheeky, very switched on. Yeah. Oh, and it's, man. but it's, again, it's the same for even, I uh, really like that you pointed this out. It's the same vein. Well, even the, uh, the children with ADHD and developmental language disorder in a mainstream school, I've had so many children say to me, I'm stupid. And I'm going, no, you just, your brain thinks about language differently. Right. I love that idea. Assume, always assume competence, right? Like I felt like that was the same idea of like, always assume your child wants to succeed and figure out how you can help them get there as opposed to just immediately assuming that they don't want to be there or they don't want to do well. Like everyone wants to do well. And so if they don't want to do well, they've probably given up trying and they, you know, and that's so tragic. So I, I love that idea of like, always assume absolute competence, um, especially in children, right? Oh my goodness. You're making me so emotional. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord, this is so incredible. God, I, I want to be mindful of the time, but I feel like I could pick your brain for so much longer. You're such a, oh my goodness. Um, thank you so much for this perspective. I really, really appreciate it. I think this is going to be quite, I mean, for a parent who might be struggling with a young child, like I was, oh my goodness. Um, uh, this will be so interesting and fascinating. Uh, so quickly, do you have another name for ADHD? If you could call it something else, did you, did you prepare something? <laughs> Um, I kind of have, so I'm trying to be mindful of the time because it's so easy for me to keep talking. Um, with, so for ages, I thought I would get rid of the, the disorder because I don't like that it implies that something is wrong. But I also, as we we're talking about before, so often when I'm, if, especially if I'm giving a language diagnosis, I'll, you know, say the term like developmental language disorder, but what I'm describing it, I'll basically say this just means that, like I said before, the child's brain thinks about language differently. So to me, it, different is the biggest, it's better or difficulty, but I don't, I think it's really important that we know that ADHD is a different, it's not on the spectrum of neurotypical, it's different again, because I know for me, it just seemed like it, kind of undercuts my experience when people are like, oh, but everyone's a bit like that, or, you know, that's really common, but it's like, no, no, this is another thing. So I think for me, I probably at the moment leave the disorder, but I probably, you will probably call it like, you know, executive function disorder or executive functioning difference because I like that. it's much bigger than the attention. And that's part of the reason why I, I think for me, it didn't, it went undiagnosed because it's like, but Lauren, but Lauren can focus really, really well. Yes, I can. 
on one thing <laughs> <laughs> when I'm motivated. But um, it's everything else that goes along with that or the other executive functions. Right. Yeah. Um, so well said. And and I think so many of us who dismissed the idea of it, even when we did know that, it, you know, even if somebody suggested, like if my therapist suggested to me, I had ADHD and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's ridiculous. Like I was kind of offended. Um, so yeah, right. That's so important. Um, I like that. I, I saw a tweet recently that's been really helping me, which is like, um, you know, somebody's like, oh, everybody, everybody loses their keys. And, and the response was like, yeah, and everybody has to go to the bathroom, Janet. But if you have to do it 90 times a day, you might uh, want to get that checked out. <laughs> and I was like, that's, right? I like that so much. I know. So I'm like that. I feel like that's been helpful for me. Whoever wrote that tweet, shout out. I don't remember where I saw it, but, um, or who, who wrote it, but I'm like, that could, maybe that'll be helpful for somebody else who's struggling with this idea of like, you know, cause I think a lot of us do struggle with that idea of like, how much am I struggling? Right. Um, well, thank you. You don't know what it's like for other people. You only know your right? experience. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so, so much for sitting down with me and sharing not only your story, but your wisdom too. I really, um, even just your diagnosis perspective was so great. I was feeling, I feel like, um, I got a lot out of this. So I know a lot of people will. So thank you so much, Lauren. Absolute pleasure. <laughs>